Good afternoon. My name is Steve Durian with Jefferson County, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the March 28, 2022 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. In this digital meeting format, members and alternates will have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions or comments on the agenda items. Uh, before we do our roll call, I'd just like to start by thanking uh, Vice Chair Sarah Grant for running last month's meeting in my absence. With that, uh, we will do roll call. Uh, Cam Kennedy will list the attendees. If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ccennedy at drcog.org so that your name can be added to the record. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance right now for members and alternates, I currently see uh, Steve Duran, Alex Hyde Wright, Art Griffith, Carson Priest, Chris Hudson, Deborah Basket, Frank Bruno, George Hollenkoff, Hillary Simmons, Jeff Dankenbring, J Justin Schmitz, Ken Johnstone, Kent Mormon, Kristen Kenyon. Mac Callison, Maria De Andre, Rick Pilgrim, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, and Walter Wirt uh, in attendance at this time, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Jacob, we don't have any in introductions this month, do we? No, sir, we don't. Okay. Then let's move on to public comment. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion for each agenda item. Do we have any public comment? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, we do. Um, the first hand I saw raised was from Matt uh, Fromer. So Matt, you're able to speak right now if you'd like. Uh, and like the chair said, you have three minutes. Uh, begin when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. So good afternoon to the Dr. Cog TAC members. My name is Matt Fromer, I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. I'm here today to commend your work on the state's new greenhouse gas planning rule and to urge you to think big on transit, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure projects. I'd also encourage you to think creatively about ways to support infill development, affordable housing and more walkable communities where people can access jobs, schools, stores and other destinations on foot, bike or transit. The best transportation plan is a good land use plan. Uh, just to back up and provide a little context on the greenhouse gas planning rule. So in 2019, the Colorado legislature passed House Bill 1261 with science-based greenhouse gas reduction targets for 2025, 2030, and 2050 to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and protect Colorado and its residents from the impacts of worsening climate disasters like drought, wildfire, and heat waves. For transportation, the largest contributor to greenhouse gas pollution in the state we need to reduce emissions by 40% by 2030 below the 2005 baseline. Electric vehicles are a critical piece of the equation, but insufficient on their own to meet the targets. In the best case scenario, electrification will get us about two thirds of the way to our 2030 climate targets, and the rest must come to reductions in the number and distance of vehicle trips. Last year, the legislature followed up with Senate Bill 260, with raised, which raised another $5.5 billion for transportation, 
and directed CDOT to develop a greenhouse gas planning rule, which was finalized in December. According to CDOT's analysis of the policy, hitting the greenhouse gas targets will require us to shift between a quarter and a third of funding and resources toward projects that reduce air pollution. Lucky for us, most of the greenhouse gas mitigation strategies identified in the rule align with the values and performance measures in Dr. Cog's Metro vision to cut pollution, reduce vehicle miles traveled, boost transit ridership, improve access to opportunity by multiple modes of transportation, increase land use efficiency, and improve safety for all users. In fact, CDOT expects the rule to deliver over $40 billion in net benefits, mostly in the form of lower vehicle operating costs, fewer crashes, and lower health expenses. To rebalance our transportation system, we need to stop wasting money on highway car capacity and make our problems worse, and instead focus our dollars on expanding options like transit, walking, and biking. So for the last year, we've been developing this greenhouse gas planning rule, and it's felt very abstract. Lots of debate about the right targets, enforcement mechanisms, reporting requirements, and metrics. But now is the part where the rubber meets the road, when we select projects for funding. After all, our true policy is not what we write in our long-term plans, but how we choose to spend our dollars. Like most of the country, Colorado has chronically underfunded clean and efficient transportation options like transit, biking, and walking. But now we're establishing ourselves as a national leader on clean transportation. Dr. Cog has all the tools and ingredients to make this a success, including a high regional growth forecast with the potential to promote transit supportive density in walkable communities, a talented staff to manage and implement the policy, and the regional partnerships to collaborate effectively. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Yes, Mr. Chair, we do. Uh, I see a hand raised from Rachel Hutton. Uh, so, Rachel, if you'd like, you're unmuted. So go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Rachel Hultine, and I'm the Sustainable Transportation Director for Bicycle Colorado. We are working with partners across the state to make sure Colorado is a safe and desirable place for everyone to choose active transportation to reach their destination. First, I wanna congratulate Dr. Cog on officially ending carbon monoxide maintenance. I was born and raised in Denver during the 1970s, making me a brown cloud native. I have many memories of seeing smog obscuring the mountains, of bad asthma days when we would have to play inside, and regular conversations about whether we could light a fire in our fireplace. It took decades of leadership and dedication to changing behaviors so that kids like me and then future generations could breathe clean air. Coordinated action to regulate gasoline and wood burning days, emissions monitoring and testing. It took decades and it worked. It's hard to ignore the similarities between reducing carbon monoxide and reducing greenhouse gas from transportation emissions. In the 70s, the brown cloud was an entirely novel situation with a seemingly impossible roadmap to success. Even though we can't look out the window and see greenhouse gas emissions, we are experiencing the devastating impacts every day. Lighting a fire is even more dangerous for entirely different reasons. We're forced to stay indoors from smoke and heat index issues. As the TAC and Dr. Cogstaff work with CDOT on mitigation strategies, and models to identify transportation priorities, it's daunting. The target is big and like everything related to transportation, the impacts of your decisions won't be seen or measured for years. But the urgency today couldn't be greater. Transportation investments must prioritize getting cards off the road. It's not gonna be easy or comfortable. As you evaluate mitigations and project priorities, please think big about the funding and the policies required for success. Now is the time to rebalance transportation funding away from lane miles and towards transit, active transportation. Together, we can do what it takes. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any other, um, any other individuals for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. All right, well, we'll close public comment.
and move on to the February 28th, 2022 TAC meeting summary. Uh, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the February 28th, 2022 TAC meeting summary? Please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question, correction, or would like to speak. Um, hearing none, we will call the, the minutes uh, final and move on to our informational items. First item, Steve Cook is going to present, uh, end of carbon monoxide maintenance. All right. Thank you, Steve. Actually, uh, I'm just going to be introducing uh, Rick Coffin of the uh, Air Pollution Control Division of the uh, CDPHE, um, who's going to uh, discuss some of the history of CO and the next steps. And uh, I have to say, I appreciate Rachel for uh, stealing some of our thunder and giving that good introduction to a little bit of the history of what it was like in Denver with uh, CO in the 70s and 80s. And I'm, I'm glad to see this great step here of being able to end uh, having to do our conformity determinations for carbon monoxide. I, I worked on that when my, in my first stint for Dr. Cog in 1985. So this is, means a lot to me and hopefully we can carry forward on uh, making progress on uh, the ozone pollutants and greenhouse gases uh, in the near future. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Rick Coffin, who is with uh, the Air Pollution Control Division, and he will give the, their presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like Mr. Ron Papsdorf has his hand raised. Go ahead, Ron. I'm, I'm looking through the attendee list, um, Mr. Chair, and I'm not sure that Rick is here. I, I chatted with him about five minutes before the meeting. Let me check my email here. Um, Yeah, I, I do not have any messages from him. Mr. Chair, I'd suggest calling an audible and maybe moving on to the smaller <laughs> forecast working group. And then uh, Steve can work to see if we can track down Rick and circle back to that item. Okay, we'll do that. So our next informational item is uh, item number five on your agenda, small area forecast working group. And this will be a presentation by Andy Taylor. Well, I appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to manage the regional planning team here at Dr. Cog. And one of the, my team's responsibilities is to develop a small area forecast as part of Dr. Cog's regional transportation planning process. Uh, I like to use this analogy of a relay race when describing this work. Uh, we're just one relay leg in a larger forecasting and modeling race or, or process. Uh, this process starts outside Dr. Cog uh, with our partners at the State Demography Office in the Department of Local Affairs. Uh, they forecast population, households, and jobs all the way out to 2050 at the moment. Uh, they, but they do this at a state level and then also down to a county level. But they don't go below that in their forecasting work, um, though they do go down uh, to the city and town level in their recent year estimation work. Their forecasting work stops at, at a county level. Uh, that's where the work at Dr. Cog begins. Uh, we use the state's work as what we call uh, sometimes county control totals. Our forecasting work is to allocate that change throughout a given county uh, in, into uh, 2,804 different small areas or what some folks would call transportation analysis zones. Uh, we use a predictive model called UrbanSim uh, that consumes local data that we get from uh, your communities as well as other proprietary sources. And then in addition to that modeling work, uh, we solicit extensive feedback on that zone level, uh, those zone level results before finalizing our small area forecast. Uh, that forecast then becomes an input for travel demand modeling. 
uh, to help forecast travel demand between uh, zones based in part on those future small area totals. And historically, this process has tended to go one way. Um, there is a bit of feedback uh, that our model and the small area forecasting side takes into account based on increased travel times due to congestion and future use uh, based on information that we receive back from the travel model and the ultimate impact on accessibility and household employment location choice. Uh, but that is some of the only feedback we get um, as part of this process uh, to, to go uh, in reverse a bit. Uh, but we also did some additional analysis this last time uh, we developed a small area forecast to explain a bit more about the implications around what that predictive small area forecast could mean uh, to explain what the gap was between those predictions and what is actually envisioned in Metro Vision. Uh, but there's also some elusive feedback that, that we're trying to better coordinate around the small area forecasting process and how to go further upstream um, to, to help uh, generate more feedback on the county control totals, on that work at the state level uh, in the state demography office, and then also more on improvements to the small area forecasting process, not just the results. And so in order to do this, uh, to achieve this additional feedback and create more ongoing conversations, uh, we're starting a small area forecast working group. Uh, and this is to provide updates, as I mentioned, on our process improvement. Um, we are taking this time right now between some of our forecasting uh, commitments uh, to do some major updates on our process and, and really take into account a lot of what we learned uh, in the last cycle. Um, and like I said, facilitate some of that coordination comment back on the state's forecast as really that is pretty determinative in the results that we see um, in the small air forecast process. And then also there's a lot of growth related topics for the Denver region that just wouldn't come up in our normal feedback process when we're just looking zone by zone and really get some feedback that can help improve our assumptions, but also hopefully find ways for us to deliver some more value uh, to local governments and, and your uh, planning work. And so we'll be, we'll be hold, holding our first meeting um, on Wednesday, April 13th on Zoom. We're inviting local governments to send at least one uh, representative. Um, we're encouraging them to identify an alternate so that folks can, can uh, miss a meeting but have a designated uh, person who um, can also be looped in on, on all this information. And we're just gonna do some introductions and try and shape some of the future topics at this meeting. Our first invite went out earlier this month. Um, we had previewed and, and announced this group way back in December when we did a MetroVision idea exchange on forecasting and how local governments do some of their own forecasting work. And so we had some initial uh, interest then, uh, and we've followed up with our roster of contacts of folks that comment on the small air forecast and um, we are sending out another invite um, here shortly before the meeting. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Anyone have any questions? Mr. Chair, I see that uh, Walter Wirt has his hand raised. Okay, Walter, why don't you go ahead? The only comment I would have, and I think this is a type of planning that is so important, there are some significant changes, as you all are aware, in the entire e-commerce distribution, dark stores, uh, local front-facing warehouses. All of this will generate a significant change in local area uh, demand and delivery. In my neighborhood, for example, there's at least three or four trucks every day, UPS, PIA, uh, Postal Service, uh, Amazon, FedEx, and whoever else they have. And this is going to not, it's not going to change. In fact, all of the uh, information that I have at my disposal says that e-commerce and this type of shopping makes, uh, is very uh, favorable with the younger generation, even some of us older folks. So. I don't know how you factor it in, but this will certainly change some of the demand factors and even some of the relationships in the future, just food for thought, if you will. 
No, thank you. I mean, that's a good topic that we can uh, float with this group. Ron, your hand is up. Would you like to speak? Yeah, um, Andy, thanks so much for presenting this to TAC today. Um, I guess my basic question for folks around this table is, um, is there a limit to the number of jurisdictions or local government members that can participate in uh, the group? And how does one get plugged into the, into the work group? So the, the best way to get plugged in at the moment is to email our senior economist, Zach Feldman. His information is on this screen and in the memo itself. Um, he is heading up uh, this process, but is away on spring break this week. So I, I drew the presentation duties. Um, we have no limit at this time. Uh, we feel like a big group uh, would really benefit. Uh, we're finding ways um, if we get a large turnout uh, to still have some, um, some small group discussions as part of that. So we'll be able to respond if we get um, big turnout. Um, we're hoping to find out if Zoom's a good way of doing this to encourage um, remove barriers to some of the, the um, attendance and travel uh, travel time. Uh, so there is no limit. We're encouraging folks to send one participant, but if folks need to send more, um, that's okay. Um, but we would really love it if everyone in the uh, every local government could identify at least one person to come and attend. Um, we really want to listen to a lot of different perspectives. Thank you. All right, next uh, we've got Matt Callison. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it, it, Andy, is there a anticipated schedule of meetings, frequency, um, and, and timing for those meetings as, as we embark on this? Um, we have not set a frequency going forward. We're anticipating doing something perhaps quarterly, um, probably not too much more. We have a um, in my division, we have a, a data consortium that meets quarterly, and it seems to be a good rhythm uh, for, for this type of work. So that's what we're targeting right now. Uh, but we're open to hearing a little bit more uh, from this first group about um, what would help them engage the most. So we don't have a, a future sequence charted out yet, um, but we hope to be able to identify that shortly after the first meeting. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Okay, next up is Jessica Furco. Hey, uh, Jessica Furco, the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, I think a few of my questions were already asked and answered, um, but we all at the RAC have a local government working group. Um, I'd love to share out this information with them and just wanna make sure that's all right. And if there's anything else specifically I should point them towards, I'd love those resources. Thanks. Um, yes, please share uh, with that group. That sounds like just the kind of group we're trying to reach. Um, there was a link in um, the, the, the memo for this packet that has um, a link to the invite itself, and that has much more information about uh, the goals and what we're imagining for this group. And so that would probably be the best place um, to send folks uh, it, just that one invite. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. And next, Ken Mormon. Andy, I just want to say, I think this is a great idea. I do hope that you have some uh, influence onto the uh, going back towards the state and that this group can do it. I know that um, you kind of used um, the uh, NATO area as a pilot program um, last time, and I think it helped a lot uh, to have that input. Um, so I really encourage everyone to, to have someone plug in from their from their agency or, or jurisdictions because because it is important that we get a good count um, for the metro area as a whole and and the best way we can do that is influence it at the start not after it's not after it's decided thank you thank you yeah. all right thanks ken any other questions for andy Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Uh, I think then we will move on to item number uh, six. 
which is a 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Update. Jacob Rieger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a second to do the screen share. Okay. All right, hopefully folks can hear me and see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog, uh, we wanted to give you an update on the work that we're doing regarding the greenhouse gas analysis with our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we realized you know, there's a lot of information in the, um, in the staff memo and there's a lot of concepts um, in the memo. So I just got a couple slides here to kind of aid our, our discussion today and kind of help break some of this down. So the first thing you should be seeing, which was included in um, your agenda packet, was um, the table, it's called table one. This is directly from the adopted GHG rule. Um, and we just wanted to share this with you um, in terms of the reduction levels that are specified in the rulemaking. So to help you understand this table a little bit, what is showing, and again, this is directly from the rule as adopted, um, it's showing the, uh, the entities and really the geographies in the sense of which the reduction requirements apply within the rule, which are the five MPOs, the five metropolitan planning organizations in this state, um, including Dr. Cog, um, as well as CDOT for the non-MPO areas of the state. So for each of our agencies, uh, we have emission reduction target levels by time frame, and that's what this table is showing for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050, and it's showing these reduction levels in terms of million metric tons. So Dr. Cog is obviously kind of the first row in this table. So you see the reduction targets that we need to hit, uh, so to speak, that we need to address through the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan um, for the rule. So I'm gonna talk about these more in context in just a moment, but I at least wanted you um, to see the numbers themselves. And let's see if I can get this to work. All right, so um, again, there was a lot of information in the, in the agenda memo. So I wanted to break this down a little bit of some of the key concepts that we wanted to communicate to you um, regarding the GHG analysis for the 2050 RTP. So in addition to the reduction targets that are defined within the rule, the rule also defines a baseline, which we use for basis of comparison and a basis for analysis in the GHG analysis. So the GHG rule defines the baseline as the 2050 RTP as it was adopted in our case in April of 2021. And it's not just the plan as adopted in April, it's actually the plan as modeled uh, for adoption in April, 2021. And we'll talk about that more in a second, but really what we're saying there is that, as you all know, as we go through the plan uh, development process, anytime that we update the plan, anytime that we amend the plan, um, you know, we do modeling associated with that in our focus model. We model the major projects that are in the fiscally constrained plan, the so-called lines on the map, dots on the map, et cetera. Um, and so it's those major projects that are included in the model and it was obviously included in the modeling work that we did uh, to adopt the plan last April. The emission reduction targets that I just showed you from the rule um, are actually from the baseline. And so this is something that's really important that I wanna make sure you understand. The baseline, so the first thing that we do, and I'll talk about this more in a second, is we're establishing kind of what that baseline is from a GHG perspective. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, as I said. But once we establish that baseline, whatever that baseline is, and it's not a fixed number, it's something that we're determining now, the emission reduction targets that I showed you from the rule, those are in addition to um, whatever we, you know, whatever we come up with in terms of the analysis where we're starting from the baseline. So they're absolute numbers, um, but they're in addition to the baseline. And as we've started to get into this work a little bit, um, what we're finding is that we're still sort of in, in the beginning of this journey. We're, we're really doing the work right now, the analysis to really understand what our GHG emissions are from the baseline. Again, the plan is adopted, um, but at least from where we're starting that there is a gap that we're going to need to meet. Um, it is, and it is going to be somewhat significant. So um, I don't wanna characterize our ability to meet that gap just yet, because again, we're just at the beginning of this analysis. Um, I think we all knew coming into it that um, our baseline itself wasn't going to, obviously wasn't going to meet the emission reduction targets, but that's the work that we're doing now is to understand both the baseline and then from the baseline, um, what is the additional sort of increment of change or the additional increment of reduction that we need to meet. And this is a little bit different from what we're used to. And so for those of you, um, and we haven't heard the presentation yet on carbon monoxide maintenance, but for those of you that are familiar with our air quality conformity analysis, 
we have motor vehicle emissions budgets that are set for us for criteria pollutants. And those budgets are set for us by time frame. And those are total amounts of things that we need to demonstrate in the fiscally constrained plan um, that we do not exceed those emission reduction targets. Here, and this is something that I want, I want you all to understand, this is a really key point in the GHG rule. Everything that's in the adopted, the fiscally constrained 2050 regional transportation plan as adopted, um, at least as it was modeled at, at the time of adoption, does not count towards our reduction targets because those things are already included in the plan. They count towards our baseline. So all of the great work that's in the plan in terms of transit projects, bus rapid transit network, uh, safety projects, multimodal projects that are in the plan, to the extent that those were already modeled at the time of plan adoption, those become part of our baseline. We don't get credit for those in meeting the reduction targets. So that's a key concept in the rule uh, that I wanna make sure is understood. And in fact, that's so important. I actually wanna stop um, here and see if there's any questions on that before I continue. I might want to check the chat, Jacob. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard for me when I'm screen sharing. Could someone yeah, let me see I'll, if I can pull up the chat? I'll read the chat. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, is uh, table number one showing annual cumulative or point in time reduction levels? That's the first question. Yeah, let's go back to the table. That's a good question. So these are these are total amounts by time frame. So these aren't percentages, these are amounts. Again, in their their amounts in million metric tons that we need to demonstrate for each of these timeframes. So for example, uh, for Dr. Cog for 2025, we need to reduce 0.27 million metric tons of GHG emissions in the 2025 timeframe. Does that answer that question? Uh, Jacob, it's Rick Pilgrim. Uh, well, I understand the, the 0.27, but then between 25 and 2030, is it another 0.82? or it's 0.82 from the baseline that includes the 0.27? I believe, Steve Cook, if you could help me with that, I believe it's yes. it's if, from the baseline. Is that Hi, right? Steve Cook here, manager of mobility analytics and operation. This is the reduction of, that's required from last year's regional transportation plan for each of these years. So last year's regional transportation plan we did calculations for 2025, 30, 40, and 50 each individual year. This is the reduction that must be shown for meeting the target that must be shown for our next updated regional transportation plan this year. So each of these staging years, as, as we call them, has a calculation done for it where we initially uh, calculate the weekday and then it's uh, converted into an annual value. So that's another point is this, this is based on an annual value, which, you know, I forget for like 2030, I believe the grand total is like 10 million metric tons and we need to reduce it by 0.82. Okay. So like a 8% reduction? Cor roughly correct. And, and then Steve, what, um, it must be, uh, considering the benefit of the improvements that we are making in those 10 year tranches so that by 2050, uh, the increment is a 0.37 and that's why it declines in those out, out years. Yeah, I'm not sure of the specific reason for the decline, but it is a cumulative thing. So there's things that are done through 2025, yeah. things that are done through 2030 in terms of uh, large scale projects, but it's also reflecting population growth and things like that. So it's reflecting the entire, the entire planning world of our transportation plan, not only transportation facilities, but the vehicle fleet uh, makeup uh, in terms of internal combustion versus uh, alternative fuel or electric vehicles. And it also has the new demographics has up for each of these years and also has new population employment and uh, even some factors related to uh, commercial vehicle trip making as was alluded to a little bit earlier yeah. uh, this afternoon. Okay, so even in 2050 with uh, the forecasted growth in population employment and the improvements that we've made to the system and uh, you know, changes to uh, 
um, fuels like uh, you know battery electric cars. That's why there's a declining level in those out years. Right, I, I think that's part of it, but also remembering that we're comparing to get this reduction, we will be comparing the results from our plan later in the year yeah. to the results of the plan last year for 2050. Okay. So it is confusing. Well, and I've, I've got another question later, but I'll wait for Jacob to finish. Okay. Any other um, questions at the moment before I continue? Uh, George, uh, it looks like you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I just need to uh, really understand. So for example, in 2050, right? If the target is 0.37 MMTs, that's really taking the 2040 level and then reducing it by 0.37 by 2050. Is that, is that correct? No. Um, that's what it looks like, but that's not what it, it's. The reduction is basically taking last year's prediction of 2050 and for the plan last year, we're going to do a new updated plan this year and we're going to calculate 2050, the, to the grand total annual metric tons. And I don't recall the exact value for 2050, but we need that value that we calculate later this year when we have uh, a, a draft, new, a new draft regional 2050 regional transportation plan. We have to subtract the result we get this year from the result we got last year. And it needs to show that we're 0.37 million metric tons less than the calculation we did for last year's plan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I those time frames. Yeah, yeah I everything is compared sense at the individual year, 2025 new is compared to 2025 old, 2040 new is compared to 2040 old. So it, it's, it's a unique setup. Got it. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is clear now. Great, any other initial questions? Okay, let me keep going. I know this stuff is really confusing. So let's see. So I think we were down to this next point. Um, again, this is a key concept, um, and this is what I was saying before I open it up for questions. The multimodal RTP investments that are already modeled as part of the plan adoption become part of the baseline for each of those analysis years. They do not count towards the reduction targets, and, and that's, that's a really important point. So all the great things that we have in the plan, all the hard work that we did together over the last two years, those things absolutely matter, but the way they show up is they show up in the baseline. We don't get to take those things and, and use them as part of credit towards meeting the reduction targets that I just showed you in the table. The only way that theoretically we could do that is if we take investments that are in later stages of the plan, let's say a BRT corridor, and we advance you know, one or more of those BRT corridors to get the uh, GHG emission reduction benefits of those projects to have them occur sooner in the life of the plan rather than later. That is one way that we can do that. But essentially, all of those investments, to the extent that they were modeled, are already baked into the plan. They become part of the baseline. And then these, these values back here in table one, these emission reduction targets are on top of that baseline. So this is different from air quality conformity because in air quality conformity, we have a total budget by analysis here that we have to meet or, or not exceed in our motor vehicle emissions budget. And while it matters how we get there, in, in one sense, it doesn't matter how we get there. The point is we have a bunch of strategies. We just need to meet that budget in that analysis timeframe. Here, we're determining a baseline first, and then we're doing the sort of relative comparison that Steve talked about for each of these analysis years with these reduction targets on top of the baseline. Is, is that clear to folks? Yes for me. <laughs> okay. Again, I know all of this is confusing. I think the key point I want you to understand from that part of it is that all the great things we have in the plan, yes, they're very important. We're glad we have them in the plan. They count and they matter, but they count in terms of the baseline. They don't specifically count in terms of the reduction targets. The work that we have to do is we have to find ways um, to have even more reduction in GHG analysis on top of the great things that are already in the plan. 
Brian, do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, Jacob, just to just to clarify one point, maybe you're going to get to this, so I, I apologize if I preempt one of your talking points, but um, there's part of what we can use to show reductions from the baseline are those things that are already in the plan that are not reflected in the modeling when we adopted the current plan. So no, you're right about sort of BRT investments that are in the plan, the, the regionally, the air quality regionally significant sorts of projects that are that are in the plan. Uh, planned transit service increases that are already reflected in the plan, but other sort of investments that weren't modeled as part of the adoption of the plan, those are things that we can use in the analysis to, to help um, achieve the reduction levels. Yep, that's the next part of the conversation. So thank you, sorry. Thank you, Ron. No, it's okay. <laughs> Any other initial questions before I keep going? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let me come back down. So uh, Ron sort of gave this away already. So thanks a lot, Ron, but, um, but it's an important point. Again, we've talked about the plan as modeled when it was adopted, but as Ron just said, the modeling does not include programmatic or other category investments. And these are actually a significant portion of the fiscally constrained plan. And that's what attachment one is that I'm gonna show you in just a second. But the point here is that in a 30 year plan, you know, we know many of the major projects, again, the lines on the map, the dots on the map, the things that were in our focus model, but there is a whole bunch of programmatic things, financial plan things, funding pots, other sort of programmatically oriented things for which projects are not yet defined. They weren't intended to be defined. Again, they were intended to be reserved in the fiscally constrained plan to be defined through the implementation of the plan over the next 30 years. Those things also really matter. They're really important. Um, and again, they're a significant portion of the fiscally constrained plan. Those are things that to the extent that we can demonstrate GHG benefit, that's part of where our analysis is right now, is to try and get a handle and try and quantify in good faith some of the GHG benefit from some of those more programmatic investments that weren't directly modeled as projects in the plan. So really that's what staff is doing right now. We're really doing two key things. One is establishing the baseline, as we've talked about kind of modeling for GHG emissions, uh, the plan as modeled adopted back in April of last year and identifying how to quantify some of these programmatic GHG benefits in the modeling work that we're, that we're doing for the GHG analysis. So let me actually show you, and again, this is in your packet. Um, this is attachment one in your packet. I'm not gonna go through this in very significant detail, um, unless you have certain questions, but I want you to understand sort of the concept of it. What this table is showing is all of those sort of programmatic or category types of investments that are in the plan beyond just the project. So that's the far left column. Things like additional transit investments, safety and vision zero investments, multimodal components of our, um, of our roadway projects that are in the plan. All of those things, we've tried to identify these programmatic elements in the plan. And then we've calculated the total funding for these programmatic investments within the fiscally constrained 2050 plan. Um, and as you see, it's, um, it's $15, $15 billion, if I have my math right, um, in the plan when you add all of these things up, right? So it's a significant um, part of the financial plan, as I've said. Then for each of these categories, staff has been working to kind of figure out, okay, of each of these things, what is the, what is the proportion or what is the percentage that we, in good faith, we could contribute or I'm sorry, that we could, um, that we could um, estimate as having GHG benefit. Um, so, you know, and that's where the percentages that you see, the estimate percentage for GHG applicability. Some of these are pretty straightforward, like additional transit investments. You know, we think that that should be pretty high in terms of potential GHG benefits. That's 90%. Regional BRT, well, we already have the BRT network modeled in the plan. So we're already capturing those benefits directly through the modeling work, but there are some ancillary improvements obviously that go towards implementing a BRT system and a BRT network. So we're saying, you know what, we've probably captured most of the GHG benefits already, um, but there's some small percentage that we think maybe should count um, towards GHG benefits. So on down the line for each of these categories, the ones at the bottom in particular, ones that are really preliminary, this is all still very draft, um, but we wanted to show you where we're at. The ones at the bottom, because they're set aside programs, in particular, those are harder to sort of quantify and to say, well, what exactly will those turn into? Um, so those percentages really are sort of preliminary. But again, the concept holds that for each of these, we're trying to understand um, in good faith and good intention, what are the GHG, what are the potential GHG benefits um, for each of these categories, each of these types of projects or investments 
that would be in the plan. And then from there, the far right column then calculates based on those percentages, what are the amounts attributable towards uh, the amounts of these investments in the fiscally constrained plan, you know, what percentage, what total is attributable towards GHG benefits. And this is sort of then the next step towards beginning to quantify in a modeling environment how we can estimate GHG benefits for these types of programmatic investments that weren't already captured in the model uh, when we modeled the plan for adoption last April. So let me stop there and take some questions on that. Alex Hyde Wright. Thank you, Ron and Jacob. Um, I'm understanding most of the percentages for GHG applicability shown on the table here, um, but I think the two that I don't quite understand is the regional BRT and the additional transit investments. So I'm wondering of the ancillary improvements for regional BRT, why is only 5% of that really considered to be applicable to GHG reductions and what is the other 95% of it doing? Um, and then for transit, it looks like 90% is tied um, to GHG reductions, which mostly makes sense, although I'm kind of wondering what the other 10% is. Sure. Steve Cook, I saw you raise your hand. Are you mm -hmm. wanting to help answer that? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, on the first one on the list, there are the additional transit investments. Um, these are things above and beyond things that we've already modeled in last year's regional transportation plan. And when we looked at where those funds were allocated within the plan, we roughly estimated that maybe about 10% of them are for things that aren't necessarily related to VMT or greenhouse gas reduction. You know, some of that is human service transportation, you know, in terms of uh, getting uh, elderly people or disabled persons to services, healthcare, shopping, whatever. So those types of things, that aspect of transit doesn't have as much of a you know, VMT uh, reduction impact. And so we just wanted to acknowledge that to say that you know, some portion of that um, is gonna be for those other types of services. On the regional BRT, the key there is that the 1.183 billion there, that is reflected in our model already. And so what this is reflecting here, it, this little small 5% amount is to say, well, some share of that funding, so, or I should say what, what's reflected in the model and in the plan already is the physical BRT services. What's not reflected in this is any of the ancillary benefits related to maybe pedestrian access, bicycle access to these BRT services. So that's where we felt, well, some, some element of that uh, $1 billion, $1.1 billion is going to go beyond just providing the transit services that we already have baked within uh, the modeling estimates. So it's kind of like a, li a little ancillary add-on. Does that Yeah, no, that, that answers my question. I I think the, the ancillary improvements, I'm not 100% sure if that's the, the best phrasing. It seems more like that's the- it, It's know, a story. tricky one, exactly. It's like we, the positive externalities of the BRT. <laughs> yeah, we probably used 10 different words before we hit this one and uh, we'll find a better one. Thanks. Right. Thanks. You know, Alex, maybe I'll just give a quick example. I think, you know, a number we would expect uh, most of these BRT projects as they're implemented, you're not just putting a new transit shelter out there and the, the specific BRT facilities. You're probably uh, reconfiguring the street on which the BRT is operating and wide ed adding additional uh, new sidewalk links or connections, right? So those, those, other, those other sort of physical infrastructure components of the project that aren't Aren't necessarily directly modeled when you're when you're modeling sort of the tran the BRT transit service itself, and and I will just say we're trying to be somewhat conservative here. We're really not trying to game the system, and we want to be transparent about sort of this process, and and we're we're really trying to do the best technical work we can to as accurately as we can represent um, these investments, and and uh, to some extent sort of leaning towards being a little bit conservative. Got it, thanks. Rick Pilgrim. Uh, yeah, 
the uh, I'm kind of along the same lines as, as Alex here, uh, but I'm looking down at the lower, uh, the, the bottom four, um, because, uh, you know, with, uh, with the direction that the amp has taken and the uh, RTO and T and the TDM set aside, uh, we're, I, I think we're gonna start to see a, a more efficient system working uh, across these uh, jurisdictional boundaries. And so I was thinking that uh, the GHG applicability might be a little stronger for those kinds of categories. It's, it's not just moving uh, vehicles through the network, it's moving them more efficiently. Uh, maybe that's hard to model, but so that's kind of a question. Yeah, Rick, let me start. And I think Steve Cook wants to help answer this question, but um, your point's well taken. Again, first of all, as Ron said, we are trying to be really conservative here. We are not trying to cook the books. We're trying to be really, really fair and in good faith about how we do this. These bottom four categories in particular is the footnote notes, um, you know, really preliminary. We're still kind of working on these. One way to think of this is the additional increment of benefit beyond what's already captured in our traffic model. So some of this, and this goes back to the BRT conversation, some of this was already captured just part and parcel of the modeling work that we already did for plan adoption. So we don't want to double count here. What we're trying to figure out is what is that additional increment of potential benefit that we can sort of justifiably fairly sort of calculate for these things. Steve, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that hit hit it very well, especially for the first two there, those two set aside programs. I mean, as he said, th those set aside programs have been around for a while. They're kind of in our base assumptions already. Um, but we think, as you mentioned, you know, that we're going to get some additional be a benefit out of those uh, in the future. For the last two, what we're still um, working on, and we're working with CDOT to get more information is, we, we think a lot of the dollars that are in that, you know, close to 5 billion when you add those two up. I think a lot of that is, is actually more routine maintenance type things uh, that's built into those large uh, dollar values there. And that's what we're working with them to get a better picture of what's included in that 2 billion and the 2.6 billion. Because um, once again, we, we don't want to double count either, but our, our hunch at the uh, early on was that a, a lot of that is is sort of routine types of activities of just maintaining our facilities and maintaining our roadways and all of the infrastructure, and pavement markings and things that are on that. So as noted, we're, we're gonna work more on this one. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Other questions? Mr. Chair, I see George Holocaust yeah. has his hand raised. Yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I think I, I just want to understand how we, are, I, I understand that, you know, miles, uh, vehicle miles traveled, right? That we are looking at, but is, I mean, maybe this is, this is, uh, you know, off the mark question, but how do we account for the transition to more electric hydrogen vehicles in all of this. So is the you know, same uh, vehicles, mile travel, vehicle miles traveled, but on, a, on a presumably vehicles that are greener, if you wish. How, how is that, if at all, factored into all of this? So thanks, George. Steve Cook and I had an agreement before the meeting that he would answer all the hard questions. So Steve, <laughs> do, you wanna, do you wanna take that one? This is actually the easiest one. We, those, the, the increase in electric vehicle and other, um, uh, you know, fuel sources, we cannot take credit for that. That is already built into the base air quality assumptions in the, so remember there's two elements of modeling that'll be done with this. There'll be the, the travel model side where we do the VMT and travel speed calculations. And then there's the moves model. And the moves model is the model that actually calculates GHG emissions. And that's run by the Air Pollution Control Division. All of the EV type factors are built into that. And so we have no 
real way of changing it. Now, that's another type of thing where, where you know, we can't take credit for is that's built in already. So there's assumptions in that that CDOT and Air Pollution Control Division have made for 2030, you know, a certain number, I think it's like a million EVs in the state by 2030, 2040 and 2050. And I think by 2050, it's nearly 100% of the light duty vehicles by that point in time. But we really can't adjust that anymore on our point here. There may be some minor ancillary factors brought in in our, in our methods, but that's another place where it's already built in. And I see Ron is gonna correct me or add on to that. No, Steve, Steve, Steve got it exactly right. I will just, just to put it maybe slightly differently, just for other folks would be, it's basic, the, the, the projected growth in electric vehicle penetration of the fleet reduced the reduction levels in the rule. So that, so if, if they hadn't already been taken account into account and we took into, in, into account in our planning efforts, our reduction, the reduction levels in that table that Jacob showed would be much larger. So the, the EV growth is already reflected in, in the reduction levels and taken into account there. As, as Steve said, if we could show that we were kind of doing more above and beyond in terms of investments that would accelerate or expand the EV uh, fleet penetration, then potentially we could, we could, um, we could uh, use that as a way to achieve the reduction targets. But I think at a, at a local or a regional level, those are, those are a bit harder. And given the amount of EVs that are sort of um, already accounted for in these reduction levels, there's uh, probably limited, more limited opportunities there. Perfect. Thank you, Steve and Ron. Yeah, that answers my question for sure. Rick, you've got your hand up. Well, yeah, I did. Um, and Jacob, Steve, and Ron, you're always ahead of me on, on things. Uh, so George's question I thought was, was good about EVs. Um, what, well, and we've got a lot of time now uh, to adjust travel behavior models, but with, uh, with the return to office and some of the changes that, that we're seeing because of remote working, uh, is, is there any urgency in looking at travel behavior changes and how that might help us with GHG? Yeah, Steve, do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, couple of aspects to that is one, we already in last year's model, and we actually worked with FHWA and others and looked at a lot of research. We already adjusted our model last year to reflect greater levels of working at home in the future years. So we, we actually, another thing where we already built that in to our model, um, we increased the percent of people, you know, on any given weekday who would be, you know, working at home, staying at home, um, whatever, we, re, we, we increased that, we think like 70, 80%. Not as high as it was in the heart of the pandemic, and even not as high as probably right now, but it's looking at some plateauing, leveling off, you know, maybe a year from now, when it's going to be at some level that will then basically continue into the future, you know, roughly in the 20% range of on any given day, 20% uh, of, you know, workers would, would not be at a workplace. Um, there's been a lot of research actually in the, just the last couple of weeks that has um, backed that up, um, that assumption up. The other element of that is next year, very late this year, next year, there's gonna be uh, a statewide household travel survey that's gonna be being led by CDOT uh, with consultants and that we're participating on. And so in 2023, um, we're gonna be getting thousands and thousands of samples across the state uh, to give us better information on things exactly like you just pointed out of of working at home, staying at home, part-time workers, you know, just defining workers is a difficult thing today compared to, you know, 
35 years ago when I started in this. Yeah. You know, now you have, you know, Instagram influencers who are, that's their job, you know, who don't go to a workplace. So you have all these different uh, types of things. But in that survey next year, um, it's going to give us really valuable information that we'll be able to use in our models, you know, starting in like 2024 or so to really uh, improve that. And also one aspect we wanna get better information on is home deliveries, package deliveries, as was mentioned earlier, which is another uh, uh, big element, which is changing and impacting, you know, the type of vehicle miles that are traveled. Great, I, I, I knew you were ahead of it, so thanks. Walter, do you have a question? Well, just a, another comment. Um, the factors that are driving EVs and the commercial transportation side are not always altruistic. Uh, it's operating expense, uh, the development of batteries that will allow class eight tractors to cover the normal diesel driven miles. The other thing that I'm glad that it, the previous spokesperson touched on is population growth. I had to reach back in my economic days, but freight's a derived demand. If I don't order anything, nothing moves. If I build a new subdivision, I now have folks ordering a product where it was a green field before. And it's the same question as, as it is with trash disposal and any of these other commercially driven projects. So it's throughout all of this planning. And I'm glad that somebody mentioned the e-commerce because everything I've read of late suggests that it will continue to be a fast growing. And there's some trends that are developing that could significantly change some of these numbers because of the way the Amazons of the world are trying to relate to their customers. Yeah, thanks, Wally. It's an important point. And, you know, as we said, I mean, we're going to add a million people to this region between now and 2050. So that presents some opportunities, but it also presents some challenges in terms of this work. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Chair, there may, I don't know if there's any other questions, but basically this is the information we want to present. Let me just kind of wrap this up and open for a last round of questions by saying that um, we wanted to show you there's no action today, but we wanted to show you um, to be transparent with you about the analysis that we're undertaking, um, show you kind of where we're at. This work really sets the foundation for the next stage of the analysis, which is that these are some of the tools in our toolbox, but they are not all of the tools. Once we get through this stage and we understand you know, when we quantify and are, and are able to articulate the GHG benefits associated with some of these programmatic improvements in the plan that we didn't previously have in the model when, when the plan was modeled as adopted, how far does that get us? That's the next question we'll be answering, of course, along with what is finalizing our baseline. So what is our baseline? What are the targets that we need to meet based on the baseline? How far does the things that you're seeing on the screen right now get us towards meeting those reduction targets? And then what comes next? Um, in terms of other strategies and other tools that we have in the toolbox under the rule um, to be able to um, additional things that we can we can model or, or that we can try um, to meet our emission reduction targets that are set for us in the rule. So I think that's all we wanted to present today, but happy to answer any last questions. I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, there we go. Hi, Alex Heidreich. Thanks, Jacob, and sorry if you already addressed this, but kind of wondering where do we go from here in terms of calculating, you know, how much dollars associated with each of these different categories and the percentages then translate into GHG reductions? Is that going to be done on a kind of one dollar equals X amount of GHG reductions for this category of improvement, or how do how do we get from the dollars associated with GHG reductions to what those GHG reductions actually are? Yeah, Steve, I saw you raise your hand. Are you wanting to? Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Good question. I was actually preparing to answer this one a few minutes ago. Um, we are working with uh, CDOT and other or MPOs across the state on uh, developing different methodologies for how we adjust the model to reflect these different things on the table. And like one example I was thinking of, I can kind of the easiest example would be something like the uh, active transportation. So with that uh, 180 million, 180, yes, 180 million dollars. Uh, remember, that's beyond what we already had uh, reflected in the in the plan and the modeling. With that 180 million dollars, we can do some sort of unit estimate of well, that that can get us X miles of 
off street multi use trail, it can get us X miles of uh, bike lanes, protected bike lanes, or it can get us X miles of sidewalks. And what we can do with those is use other methods that have been developed around the country to try to see what those estimates of additional miles would get us in reduced VMT, or also uh, give us indication of what kind of dials or levers within our model of like bicycle attractiveness factors to move up or down or turn that dial higher or lower for various types of you know the many hundreds of factors that are in the model. So it's next step, you know, we could almost have on the right of this would be, you know, number of miles of XYZ. And then the next column over would be because of those number of miles, you know, research shows that you should be able to get, you know, X uh, number of uh, fewer VMT or fewer miles traveled by uh, in, you know, in internal combustion vehicles. So that's one example. And that's what we sort of have to do with all of all of these is kind of take take that amount the end end amount, put some kind of a unit equivalency to it. It may be physical units or it may be service units, you know, amount of transit service. And then from that, we can do estimates of VMT reduction. Uh, George, go ahead. Yeah, I promise this is the last question on this topic. So just one thought came to mind, you know, coming from the aviation angle of, of you know, and point of view is, do we factor in potential, although it's very hard to, you know, guesstimate at this stage, you know, what the impact would look like is probably minor, but, you know, if you're, you're thinking 2050 um, to have, you know, some mix of, you know, surface delivery and drone delivery of you know packages and stuff and then also the aspect of advanced air mobility that may take probably a, a small portion of you know vehicle miles traveled on surface and by going you know uh, through the air to to get from a to b in the in the metro area is have we somehow factored in these into our assumptions modeling assumptions yeah, George, that's a really good question. Let me start an answer and I see Steve popping up again, but I'm giving you too many chances, Steve, so let me try. Um, I think um, first, you know, it's a good point and I think it's clarification here is that we're really focused on service transportation and in Senate Bill 216 and in the state's GHG roadmap when they talked about, um, when they did the GHG analysis and looked at the different contributors towards GHG, you know, we're really, really here focusing on surface transportation, but recognizing that although it's the largest source of emissions, there are obviously other, you know, sort of emissions emissions associated um, with GHG. So we're not directly looking at aviation. Um, and I think it'd be pretty hard to sort of estimate even a minor percentage of things like drone delivery. Um, but I think your point is well taken. And Steve, I don't know if you'd want to add to that, but. Yeah, I would just note that one component of our regional travel model is a commercial vehicle model and for uh, commercial vehicle trips of all types. And they can be by any type of wheeled motor vehicle at the moment, a uh, rubber tired vehicle. Uh, we have not at this point done any changes to that model um, in terms of reflecting, you know, new technologies such as, uh, such as drones or even other, you know, very beneficial things such as a consolidated freight, you know, drop off pickup points, having more of those in newer developments, you know, so the vehicle doesn't have to drop, go to every single house and drop off. So there's, there's promise for uh, increases in consolidated pickup and drop off points uh, for consumers. Those two things as examples, we have not specifically brought into um, our future, you know, model yet, but you do raise you know, an interesting point, and I think we will look at that in the, the next couple of weeks of um, if there is any you know, research and literature to back up potentially some changes in the assumptions that we have in our model. Um, the difficulty is just that there's, there, there's nothing concrete yet, you know, a lot of great ideas out there. 
Uh, but I think you raise a very, very uh, valid, valid point that we definitely uh, need to look into more. Thank you. That answers my question. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have on this one. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. More to come, for sure. Well, we do have Rick Coffin has joined us. So why don't we go back to the item uh, number four, end of carbon monoxide maintenance, and I'll hand it off uh, to Rick. Thank you, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, and uh, sorry for being late to the meeting. That was my fault. I had a placeholder on my calendar for the incorrect time. So thanks for your flexibility. And I will share this presentation. All right, can you all see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm Rick Coffin. I'm a planner with the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHE. And uh, today I will be presenting on the Denver Metro and Longmont, Longmont carbon monoxide maintenance areas um, and our upcoming redesignation request to EPA. So I'll go over some background information about carbon monoxide in the area, um, plans that were developed uh, over the decades um, to meet and continue to meet the carbon monoxide uh, standard. And then I'll close off by discussing our redesignation request. First, some background information about carbon monoxide or uh, CO. It's a colorless, odorless gas. Um, it, it can cause harmful health effects by reducing oxygen to the body. Um, it's typically uncommon for high levels to occur outdoors, um, but when they are elevated, they could be particularly bad for people with some types of heart disease, also for pregnant women and um, unborn children. Now, uh, mobile sources are the main contributor to CO in the US, uh, including the Front Range area. <clears throat> and, okay, let's see here. here we go. And here's just some history of the uh, EPA's uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, um, for CO. Uh, the first one goes back all the way to 1971. And uh, a primary and secondary standard was put into place. And a um, quick note about that, primary standards are uh, for protecting public health. So um, sensitive populations such as people with asthma, um, people with heart condition, children, the elderly. And then secondary standards are for public welfare protection. And that could be um, anything from visibility to protecting crops, buildings, animals, and so on. So the, the levels have, uh, for the primary standard, have held at 35 parts per million and um, over a one hour period and nine parts per, per million for an eight hour period as um, monitored at our monitoring locations. Uh, and basically that standard cannot be exceeded more than once in a year. Uh, and if, if it is, then we're in violation of the, the standard. And um, the, the secondary standard was revoked in 1985 because EPA um, periodically goes back to review um, their standards every, every so often. And basically my understanding is that the secondary standard was revoked at that time because uh, the, the research um, couldn't justify keeping it in place, but there was um, more than enough research to keep the primary standard um, as, it, as it is. So some, some history here with the Denver Metro area in the seventies, uh, we had a, a, a very high uh, CO 
um, level throughout the 70s. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, there was the infamous brown cloud <clears throat> over Denver, um, over 100 exceedances of the, of the standard each year in the early 70s. Um, and we were originally designated as non attainment for CO um, under the Clean Air Act in 1977. That's an old photo of rush hour in Denver. That's what rush hour looked like in the 70s. <laughs> Some more photos. <clears throat> Pretty, um, you know, startling to, to see this. And uh, here's, here's a map of the area that's defined as the Denver Metro CO area, multi-county area going from Douglas all the way up to Boulder, and then the Longmont CO area as well. So in, in the 80s, uh, well, the late 70s um, into the 80s, the state started to uh, work on um, various measures to address CL, but really the big um, game changer was mobile source emissions um, decreased due to federal tail type standards and fleet turnover. Um, catalytic converter helped quite a bit and um, you know, that, that on its own, um, you know, may have been enough to bring the area into attainment of the standard, but the state did a lot of work, um, passing regulations, uh, such as the, uh, air quality control commission rules, um, to require the use of oxygenated gasoline. Um, and we were the first state in the country to do that. Um, Basically, the use of oxygen, oxygenated gasoline um, helps the, the fuel burn more efficiently and that decreases the CO emissions, um, I think notably in cold weather. And then um, wood burning stoves are also a source of CO emissions and um, they were used uh, more commonly in the state uh, for heating purposes, you know, decades ago. So um, we have a regulation with uh, wood burning stove standards. <clears throat> and then the frequency of the exceedances decreased dramatically by the early 90s. Um, but because we had exceeded the standard so many times, leading up to that point, uh, the EPA classified the area as a moderate CO non attainment area. Uh, and then the, the state developed and submitted a state imp implementation plan or SIP for both of the areas uh, in 1994. And um, there, there were some plans in place before that, but um, this was, this was a, a, a big one uh, in 1994. It included emissions inventories, programs to reduce emissions, such as the regulations um, listed above, monitoring requirements. So we have so many CO monitors throughout the whole area and an attainment demonstration. Um, we also had, uh, back then it was called mobile source emission budgets. Um, nowadays it's called motor vehicle emission bu budgets in the SIPs. Um, but basically through modeling, um, we, we look at all of the different sources in the area um, for mobile sources. And uh, basically we, we, we put forth a, a, a budget. So um, the area has to, the, the modeling for the area has to um, come below the, the threshold for the emission budget. And um, let's see here. So thanks to all of the, the rules that were put in place and the federal stand, um, standards and everything. The Longmont area experienced its last violation of the CO standard in 1988. And Denver, Denver uh, experienced its last violation of the standard in 1995. And that was the last um, violation uh, in the whole state. <clears throat> so it's been decades um, since since we have uh, had high levels. And, uh, and later on in the presentation, I'll have a slide showing the long-term uh, levels. So once an area 
has met the CO standard uh, and yeah, has met the CO standard, they may uh, submit a request for redesignation from non-attainment to maintenance slash attainment um, to the EPA. So in the in the mid nineties, the state uh, started to work on that. And basically all of the Clean Air Act requirements have to be followed for the state to be eligible to do that. Um, standard have to be met, there has to be a SIP in place. We have to be able to show that the, the levels, um, you know, can be maintained. And we also have to submit a maintenance plan that has um, been submitted and approved by the EPA. So in the mid to late 90s, uh, we started working on that. And here's a timeline. And, you know, this just kind of illustrates with air quality planning, how, how much of a long term issue this is. And, you know, it's, it's helpful because currently we're in non-attainment um, for ozone. And, you know, as we've been talking about in this meeting, um, we're also trying to meet greenhouse gas um, goals as well and um, you know they go out decades into the future so this is really a long a long game <clears throat> but as you can see uh, the you know the, the first plans were submitted for Denver in 2000 and Longmont in 1996 and EPA's first effective date of each plan was in 2002 and 1999 um, under the maintenance plan requirements, the state has to submit one 10 year plan. And then after 10, year, um, 10 years go, goes by a second 10 year plan. Um, and the, the important dates here are in the, the third column, the effective date of the first plan, and then what conformity applies through, which is the last column. And you can see that's 20 years from the effective date of the first plan for each of them. So basically, the area has to show that they have maintained the standard for 20 years. And then after 20 years goes by, um, you can request to no longer be designated as a maintenance area. Um, so that's, you know, eventually when we come into attainment for the ozone standard, we'll have to do this for 20 years. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, I think 20 years, you know, 25, 30 years into the future um, for all the stuff. But so as far as the maintenance plans, they include emissions inventories, maintenance demonstration with modeling, um, same thing, our monitoring network, verification of continuing attainment and control measures. So we, we had the tailpipe standards and regulations in there, the wood burning uh, control, wood burning stove control programs, um, and also some permitting requirements for um, various industrial um, facilities. And sometimes that comes with emission limits as well. And here are the long term um, values for CO in the Denver and Longmont area. As you can see, they really dip down. Um, in the in the 90s and you know i asked our our monitoring folks that from our technical services team like why didn't they go up a little bit you know it's not that much but a little bit you could see in 2013 2014 and then 2018 and you know they said that they really didn't know um it could have been just kind of a perfect storm um you know May, maybe folks were driving more, there was more heavy, heavy duty traffic, more oil and gas activity, and maybe some wildfire smoke and the meteorological conditions all combined had that tiny little increase over those years. But, you know, as you can see, even with wildfires um, kind of raging over the last few years, the, the, the values did not correspond with that. So the, the levels have been so low for so long um, that you know, we're, we're requesting a redesignation to attainment since we have exceeded 20 years of continued maintenance for, for these areas. 
Um, and so unfortunately, EPA doesn't automatically just say, okay, you, you've been in attainment of, um, of the standards for 20 years or you, you've complied with it and now you're all good to go. Um, we have to submit a request for redesignation and we have to also show that there's no chance of backsliding, um, you know, and having the levels go up and, you know, um, exceeding the standard sometime in the future. So because of that, basically everything in these maintenance plans have to remain in effect until EPA um, redesignates the area to attainment. And the, the one thing that no longer applies after 20 years of continuing the maintenance is transportation conformity and general conformity requirements. So um, the good folks at Dr. Cog um, have had to do conformity, transportation conformity determinations for CO for these areas um, for, for so many years, basically showing that your plans um, you know, are within the motor vehicle emission budgets. Um, and you conform to the Clean Air Act requirements. General conformity is for other federal government, um, federal funded activities like HUD housing projects and um, sometimes uh, projects at uh, Denver International Airport, things like that. Um, and for carbon monoxide, the anti-backsliding demonstration or 110L demonstration, um, EPA has signaled that because you know, it's extremely unlikely for levels to go back up um, to increase in the future based on just where we're heading with motor vehicles and standards um, and how low the, the levels have been for decades. Um, a, a simple review of monitoring data should um, fulfill that requirement. And then these are our next steps. Um, we're, we're hoping to bring this before the Air Quality Control Commission for their adoption this summer. In Colorado, whenever we um, do anything like this um, with SIPs, um, the legislature has to review it and then uh, it will be submitted to EPA in summer of 2023 after we get it back from the legislature. So, um, I didn't put on there like when we expect to hear back from EPA, it probably wouldn't be for a year and a half to two years. So, you know, we might be um, still considered maintenance areas until 2025, but who knows, you know, time will tell. Uh, that's all I had. So if anyone has any questions. Not seeing any hands. So I don't think we've got any questions for you, Rick. Thank you very much for your presentation. All right, yeah, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for all the good work you do. Um, you know, Dr. Cog's been a good partner for us in putting together, you know, uh, some of our plans. So we, we really appreciate it. All right, our next item, going down now to item number seven, 2022 raise grant requests. Ron Papstorf, would you like to do this presentation? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, if Josh could bring up the table that we sent out on Friday afternoon. First of all, I just want to um, thank um, everyone who um, submitted um, information on potential raise grant applications this cycle. If you'll recall, uh, during last year's raise grant cycle, we um, had a similar process and asked folks that were considering applying for a federal uh, grant under the RAISE program just to give us some simple information about sort of the, the project, the very basic kind of limits and scopes of the project and sort of the potential uh, both grant request and overall project cost. And, you know, we think that this is important from sort of a transparency uh, and an openness standpoint, just so that we're all aware of what might be coming uh, forward. And then also it helps give Dr. Cogstaff a heads up on uh, what what requests for support letters we might have. And, and I think as a region has the added benefit of just making sure that there's 
broad awareness of uh, what uh, jurisdictions uh, throughout the region might be might be seeking uh, grant funds for and, and identify potential opportunities for um, either partnership or uh, mutual benefit and, and other support where you might not have thought that support might exist. Um, so we, uh, by the by the deadline, we received um, seven uh, submittals. I'm just going to kind of go down this list real quickly. Not not going to go into much detail. Um, we did send out sort of uh, the forms that were submitted by each jurisdiction. So if there are questions about specific projects, certainly if if there's anyone from those jurisdictions um, at the meeting, we uh, they can have an opportunity to answer any specific questions. Um, but the purpose of this is not to vet the projects, it's not, we're not asking for any sort of approval or head nod, it's, it, it really is about information sharing and transparency. And uh, just as a teaser, probably expect that we will, we will continue to sort of go through this process uh, for future federal discretionary grant programs, uh, especially considering that there are so many more uh, kind of new ones uh, as a result of the federal infrastructure bill that was passed late last year. So uh, for uh, by way of quick background for folks that aren't aware, applications for this round of uh, raise grants are due um, April 14th, so just in a couple of weeks. The, there is a maximum amount that can be awarded to any one state cumulatively, and that's about 304, just over $340 million out of the amount that's available nationally. The minimum grant award is $5 million. The maximum grant award for any one project is between 20, it's either, it's between 25 million and 45 million, and that's a, a strange nuance of the funding mix um, that funds the program. Um, projects that are awarded have an obligation deadline of the end of September of 2026, um, and the maximum uh, federal share through the raise grant uh, program towards a project cost is 80%. So that, those are sort of the broad outline, broad uh, brush outlines of the of the raise grant program this cycle. So uh, Boulder County and or uh, CDOT uh, are uh, pre uh, preparing an application for uh, Colorado Highway for State Highway 119 uh, mobility improvements uh, from Foothills Parkway to um, Hover Street, um, requesting, uh, anticipating a request of $25 million. Brighton, looking at improvements on Bridge Street, uh, which is uh, State Highway 7. Um, East of east of US 85, I believe, between 22nd Avenue and 42nd Avenue, uh, potential request of $12 million. Uh, Douglas County um, and Castle Rock looking at um, additional request for Crystal Crystal Valley uh, Parkway interchange at I-25. Um, uh, the information we got did not indicate what the anticipated uh, grant request or project cost uh, was on that form, so I'll point that out. Uh, CDOT's anticipating applying for um, uh, grant funds to um, reconstruct and improve the interchange at 6th Avenue in Wadsworth. Uh, it's a $25 million grant request for an approximately $100 million project. City of Golden, uh, US 6 and Heritage Interchange. Uh, improvements again uh, looks like a, about a twenty-five million dollar um, request towards a sixty million dollar project. Uh, Den uh, seeking some support for um, design and environmental clearance for Pena Boulevard improvements from I seventy to Gun Club Road, and then finally uh, Commerce City uh, for um, improvements to Eighty Eighth Avenue. Um, uh, from I-76 to Highway 2. So I mean, several of you are probably aware of these projects. Uh, the only one of these projects that is not in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan is the Bridge Street uh, project from the city of Brighton. So with that, I'd, happy to, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions or uh, if, there's, are there, if there are specific questions about specific projects and there are staff uh, from those jurisdictions, happy to turn it to them to, to speak to their project. Are there any questions? Not seeing any hands, not seeing any chats. So I think that, uh, so I think we're, we're, uh, we've got it covered. Great. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thank you. Okay, that covers all of our informational items today. We do have a couple of administ administrative items. Uh, we have, uh, 
AMP working group update. That's something. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Chair, this is uh, Carson Priest. I serve as the representative for the AMP for the TAC here. Just a short update, um, as always. We had a meeting earlier this month. Uh, we held our election for officers for the next year uh, and then heard a number of informational briefings at this meeting, including one from CDOT about their multifaceted electrification efforts. Uh, we also heard from a few folks about the CSU CARE e-bike program, one of the Colorado Energy Office e-bike programs that are spread around across the state. Uh, and we had a conversation in response to a data and data sharing um, working group survey. Uh, that's probably all I'll say here today, but if you have questions, um, please re reach out to me or Emily Lindsay at Dr. Cog. I'm sure we'll be able to help answer those All right, thank you very much. Ron, did you have a item you wanted to discuss under this portion of the agenda? Unmute myself, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a couple, couple of announcements that just wanted to make folks aware of. So uh, hopefully most of you have, or all of you, hopefully all of you um, have, have um, heard that uh, Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett's offices are soliciting ideas for um, fiscal year 2023 appropriations earmarks. This was uh, similar to what was done uh, last year. Um, as part of the omnibus um, appropriations bill that was um, passed by Congress um, earlier this month, there were a few um, appropriation earmarks that were included. Um, in that bill, just a couple in this region, um, and the Senate offices are soliciting new ideas for next year um, if Congress elects to uh, include um, earmarks again, otherwise known as congressionally directed spending. Um, and just wanted to make, make sure folks were aware, I believe that the deadline for submitting those through the Senate offices is April 8th, if that's incorrect, I'm sure someone on this call knows that. Um, better than I do. Uh, there is a form available uh, through each of the Senate office uh, web, those Senate office websites that they're asking for information on. Um, it, I, will, I will say that we are still trying to understand if the appropriation earmarks is sort of additional money above and beyond uh, what the state and the region would otherwise uh, receive through uh, formula distribution um, under the under the infrastructure law and the uh, transportation, housing, and urban development appropriations uh, bills. And, um, uh, but there are generally fairly short timeframes to obligate any funds that you might receive through uh, congressionally directed spending um, earmark and for spending those funds. So we would certainly um, encourage you um, if you're thinking about uh, submitting a project for an earmark request contact us, reach out to me, let's talk it through, let's check on sort of the status in the RTP and in the, in the uh, TIP. Uh, we wanna make sure that if you are successful in receiving um, an earmark, if you decide to pursue one, that you can actually deliver that project. And uh, to, that, to that point, um, uh, first of all, know that out of fairness to all of the jurisdictions in the region, um, if a jurisdiction receives a congressional earmark for a project um, and that earmark is not enough money to fully deliver the project that the funds were earmarked for, uh, the Dr. Cog directed funds through the TIP is not the place to come for additional funding to, to uh, fill that funding gap, uh, that that is the local agency sponsor's responsibility to deliver that project. It's very similar to our own um, TIP policy. Um, and we just want and. Uh, you should really consider sort of the status of the environmental clearance and, and planning and design for those projects to make sure that they're ready to proceed and they can be and they can be readily tipped uh, to move forward into uh, into um, de project delivery. Uh, Mac, I see your hand up. Do you have a question about earmarks? Yes, I do, Ron. Thank you. Uh, question is actually two questions. One, uh, are these additive or do they supplant, which you touched on? Uh, so we're, it, unclear at this point, at least from the recon that we have. 
it's a it's a little bit unclear. We are we are working diligently to try to get a definitive answer from uh, the administration on on that and from congressional appropriators uh, and leadership to know that for certain because it has a significant impact. Right, if it if it um, reduces the amount of money available, keep in mind that we are we are currently in the process of starting to allocate. Uh, resources through the TIP process, and so if the if the earmarks sort of supplant existing uh, uh, anticipated revenue, uh, then we will have to do some work with the TIP and um, remove potentially uh, remove projects, remove funding from projects that already have TIP funds programmed to them to make room for an earmarked project. And our process would be first to look at projects that are in the TIP from that sponsoring agency. Uh, if there's not or not enough, then we would have to look at projects within that uh, within that um, congressional district um, and in that um, Dr. Cog subregion. And then, if there's not uh, still enough, we'd have to look um, at other projects from um, other congressional districts or other subregions. Uh, we hope that that's not the case. We hope that it's additive. Uh, we are working really, really hard to get a definitive answer on that. It's not been clear. Okay, and and when you do, could, well, you you'll, uh, you can broadcast that out to us. Absolutely, yeah. well, Mac. And then, uh, have you heard of the uh, the ceiling amount or the range, um, Mac? As far as I know, there there is not one. Um, I I will say from just just speaking from what uh, projects received earmarks in Colorado this last cycle and. Going in the way way back machine in the in the days when when um, I worked at the local government level um, under kind of the previous earmarking era, um, you know, typically you're you're you'd be really fortunate if you're able to receive an earmark that's um, five million dollars more than a couple million dollars. Um, it, it there it's it's tends not to fund uh, very very large projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And that's just my experience. Again, sure. there has, there's no, none of that. They haven't provided, Hey, we're only going to do this much, or we only, uh, we're only going to entertain projects of this size. I'm just, just looking at sort of what the earmarks were this last cycle and sort of previous, previous, uh, earmarking cycles a decade or so ago when they existed before, um, you know, a, a $2 million earmark would be a pretty significant earmark. Five would be great. Yeah, yeah, we haven't seen any any uh, uh, documentation actually on on a, on an established ceiling on that. Okay, thank you, Ron. Appreciate that. Okay, Mr. Chair, my second announcement just was to uh, make folks aware that the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, just last week, I believe, uh, released a new notice of funding opportunity, um, and unlike uh, previous practice, they've actually they're actually doing a combined notice of funding opportunity or NOFO for three different grant programs. So it's a combined application uh, for covering three of the federal discretionary grant programs. One, you all are uh, pretty well aware of, it's a previous grant program that existed under the FAST Act and continues under the uh, infrastructure law and that's the INFRA program. There's about one and a half billion dollars available uh, this year for uh, nationally for INFRA uh, projects. There's a new uh, grant program that was uh, created under the infrastructure law called MEGA. This is for uh, really large projects and large grant requests. There's a billion dollars available nationally under MEGA. And then the final is another uh, new grant program that was created under the infrastructure law for rural surface transportation improvements. And that it has $300 million available um, nationally. So a little bit smaller scale than the other two, but it is one combined NOFO, one combined application. Uh, my quick read of the NOFO is that um, can use sort of that application structure and a project would be considered under all three of the programs unless the applicant specifically said that they wanted to opt out of consideration under one or more um, of, the, of the grant programs that's available. And then USDOT would sort of decide uh, which program, uh, if, if they elected to fund a grant uh, request, uh, which, which of those three programs to fund it um, out of. Um, quickly, um, uh, under the guidance, um, 
uh, projects should be fairly well ready to go. Uh, they want projects that are uh, in regional transportation plans. NEPA should have been completed already or can be, it has a viable path to complete NEPA within a very reason, a very quick time frame. Uh, the, um, the mega projects are for projects, half of the money will fund projects uh, of $500 million or more in project size. And then half of the money is available for projects costing between 100 million and 500 million dollars. So these are pretty big projects. Infra, 85% uh, of the money is for projects requesting at least 25 million dollars of grant funds. Uh, only 15% is available for projects between $5 million and, and $25 million in um, grant requests. And then the rural, the rural program. Um, uh, likewise, kind of focused on larger projects. 90% of the funds is reserved for, for uh, uh, $25 million or more, and 10% is reserved for projects of uh, $25 million, less than $25 million. So that's real quick. Um, I would encourage you, you can do a quick search for um, on the U.S. Department of uh, Transportation website uh, for um, the mega, mega grant, and you, you can find the NOFO. Um, again, uh, we want, if, if you have a good competitive project for any of those programs, uh, we want to support you going after those. This is, these discretionary grant programs are definitely good opportunities to bring new money into the state and fund important priorities. And so anything we can do to be helpful uh, in your pursuit of those funds, we stand ready. Okay, thanks, Ron. All right, well, our next meeting will be the first one in person in quite some time. We'll be in person at the Dr. Cog office at 1.30 on April 25th. So I look forward to seeing your faces actually live and in person. With that, we will, oh, Phil, you've got another question. Just a quick question about that. Is our mask still required for that, for in Dr. Cog office or, or not? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, Phil. Uh, our policy is to follow all CD, CDC, state, and local requirements, and currently there is no indoor mask mandate um, at this time. So as long as that continues to be the case, uh, masks will not be required. Um, and, but I will say, if anyone um, uh, feels better about wearing a mask. They should. They should absolutely do that if they if they feel that they should wear a mask for their own personal safety or those of others that they uh, come in contact with. Uh, definitely, uh, you should you should do that. But we do not have a we do not have a, a current indoor mask mandate. Thanks, Ron. The church has stand up. Okay. Just a quick question. Would you? consider making this in-person and virtual, like a hybrid meeting, or it will be 100% in-person? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Appreciate the question. Unfortunately, the, um, the technology equipment in the conference room that's large enough to accommodate TAC, and that's the main conference room down on the, on the main floor, um, of our building just is not capable of really accommodating a virtual meeting uh, well. Um, it would end up being a, a pretty poor experience for both those trying to participate remotely and those participating in person. So we've decided at least for this meeting and, and a couple of other, other meetings that occur down there that our best approach is to do an in-person meeting. Thanks. And Jessica Michelbust. Hi, thanks. I realized I could probably use the chat. For those of us who haven't been um, in person for a Dr. Cog meeting, will you be sending out directions for transit options, parking, and all that type of thing? Well, thank you, Jessica. We, we definitely will. I know there, okay. are, there are probably people here that have never been to Dr. Cog's office because they're new to TAC. Uh, so we'll, we'll make sure we get some information out ahead of that meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, I think that's all of our questions. So we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for attending today and we'll see you next month. Thanks, Good Steve. Meeting. Thanks. Thank you.